Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Gaming Silicon video, we're going to be discussing a recent interview with Raja Kadori with PC World. Now, while AMD have certainly released quite a lot of information, and at least at a higher level of the Vega architecture, Raja Kadori's comments do give us some insight into what they are planning as a company. I won't go into all of it because, quite frankly, it's a pretty lengthy interview. It's over 40 minutes. But I do want to touch on some of the highlights that I feel are very pertinent to us and our discussions. I'll link, of course, the full interview in the video description. But as I said, I've cherry-picked a few uh, particular areas which I feel... A lot of viewers are going to be interested in concerning Vega. And this actually builds us a much more elaborate image in our mind of both what we've seen in the tech demos and what we may see in the consumer oriented space for Vega. So there's a few notes that I want to bring out. The first is the whole HBCC, which is the higher bandwidth memory controller and actually data efficiency. Now, we have already gone into what this is. Essentially, it is the ability of the GPU to decide what data is pertinent to keep within its own memory, in other words, resident to the local uh, VRAM of the GPU. So, for example, let's say you have a 4 gigabyte card. Well, not all data that you're going to fill in with that into that card is always going to be required at all times. And sometimes data gets old. Sometimes data doesn't need to be used right this second because the asset is not, let's say, in view for several moments, whatever the case may be. I'm somewhat simplifying, of course, for this particular video. Now, what is interesting is that a lot of games actually overestimate their VRAM usage scenario. So, for the example, a game might request to partition 4 gigabytes of memory inside the GPU. Let's say for this video that you have an 8 gigabyte GPU, um, so 8 gigabytes of memory local to the GPU. The game might decide, hey, I need 4 gigabytes for all of my assets. And so what it does is it basically sets up a, a request the GPU driver will then say, okay, well, we're going to make this little partition, this little box of memory, which is specific only for this application. However, quite often, the game doesn't actually require this amount of VRAM. And this has been one of the reasons that you'll notice that PC gra graphics cards, 4 gigabyte versus 8, doesn't actually suffer that much. If you start going down lower than uh, 4, for example, to about the 3 mark, and certainly the 2, you'll start seeing a hitching in frame rate, but it's not a really big deal. Raja has also pointed out that he doesn't want the focus necessarily to be on the amount of VRAM anymore. Instead, he wants to focus primarily on memory bandwidth. What he has said is that games will consume less memory on launch, so... Um, I'm slightly paraphrasing, but he said current games won't be hugely different, but latter games will be, especially as developers get better uh, used to the architecture. But alt tabbing will be a lot faster because data inside the VRAM won't, uh, won't all have been used. However, that isn't to say that a game, let's say, that requires 8 gigabytes of RAM, but you've only got 4 gigabytes in the Vega architecture with the older uh, title. It won't not. It might not necessarily run uh, completely smooth, but it will be still smoother than what you would uh, uh, see from the old from the uh, current GPU. Would, would be in a similar circumstance. He also elaborated a little more on programmable geometry pipeline as well as the pixel pipeline. Um, he said that in DOS X, there's 220 million polygons average, of course, per scene. That is per frame. But in reality, most of the time, you only see about 2 million of those polygons. Uh, DrawStream handles pixels in very much a similar type of circumstance. And so, how much difference it makes per frame actually varies massively. You could have this situation where the performance of one frame is barely impacted because perhaps there's not too much on screen, therefore not a lot of overdraw. On the other hand, you could have another situation where, let's say, you're in, oh, I don't know, kind of like an office, and there's loads of desks, and there's loads of things which could possibly be covering uh, or rather hindering your vision of something else, and perhaps 
behind the desk you can see like a window perhaps behind that there's um perhaps i don't know uh, a a city block scene maybe with some flowers in some uh, you know plant pots outside and you know you're in these bay windows and there's a whole bunch of stuff and it's a very complex scene to render because there is just so many moving parts <coughs> excuse me so much geometry in which case that may see a bigger uh, increase in frame rate and so he said that he doesn't really want the discussion to necessarily focus on the teraflops this has been something i've hinted at for a while now a t-flop is not actually just a t-flop it really is much like clock speed per cpu it really comes down mostly to the architecture itself and what you do with that level of performance. So their goal isn't just to keep cranking things faster and faster and faster, but instead to make the GPU more efficient so that what they put in for a particular price point can be um, faster than the previous generation while keeping the price low. I'll give you an example. The RX 480 hit like $200 when it was first released, which was way lower than most people anticipated, and it did somewhat shake up the market. It offered a hell of a lot of performance for a low price point, and was actually technically VR capable. And not just VR capable, it could run like 1440p games. Not too much issue. Another thing that was cleared up regards Doom. Now, um, he was asked, quite frankly, what would the GPU, uh, that would be the Vega card, run at if it was running on OpenGL, which is obviously a lot more optimized. He still said that it would still beat the GTX 1080 they've been using in tests, but he doesn't believe it would either be by as much, and he's not as confident. And the reason he said that is because OpenGL doesn't have as many low-level optimizations as what's available in Vulkan. Quite frankly, in a uh, slightly paraphrasing, but it's a legacy API. And so, to their mind, AMD's mind, and I'm assuming mostly for NVIDIA as well, especially in the future, the industry is marching towards Vulkan and DirectX 12. So, because uh, that was a latter question, he, you know, what what's happening with older APIs? And he said, well, they've only got a certain number of engineers, so really they're trying to look towards the future rather than legacy products, is basically what he said. Which I can kind of understand. Um, and to be fair to AMD, the DirectX drivers, DirectX 11 drivers, have improved some anyway. Now I'm going to leave you with one final thing in this particular video. And that is perhaps the biggest out of all of them. What silicon was it that we saw demo doom and all these games up until this point and by what silicon you're going to say well it was vega yeah okay smart ass but what version of vega some people thought it was the very high end some people thought it wasn't there was some ambiguity there now he actually squirmed a hell of a lot when the interviewer said it was vega 10 and you can see that it was not supposed to be revealed it was vega 10 although to be fair i think most tech enthusiasts knew that at this point but he didn't tell us what silicon it was exactly. But what he did do is say that it's not really um, 100% that that is the highest end card. He said basically that they're still trying to figure out yields, clock speeds, uh, TDP, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Therefore, they probably don't know yet where this particular product, where this particular SKU falls within the the gamut of all of their products now personally speaking i'm going to make the assumption that they're going to have multiple product tiers all with vega vega 10 vega 11 forget vega 20 for a moment vega 10 vega 11 um vega 10 being the high end which would probably be the hbm2 versions and the lower end ones are going to be like gddr 5 perhaps 5x memory and i'm going to make the assumption and i'm basing this on an assumption i'm not basing this on fact i'm going to make the assumption that there's probably going to be the f equivalent of the 460 the 470 the 480 there'll probably be like a 490 and then there's possibly going to be two equivalents of the furies so that would of course be the fury and the fury x so i'm going to make the assumption once again 
that there's probably going to be a card which has like 36 compute units, which is currently the 480. So I'm going to say that would be the 580. There'll probably be like a 590, which will have maybe 44-ish compute units. And then you're going to have 56 and 64, which will be the various Vega cards. We do know the high-end card has 64. That's been revealed in leaks. But... As I said, he hasn't confirmed yet where this falls in the stack, and they haven't confirmed whether this is the bleeding edge card or whether there's still room for them to increase the clocks and so on, which is quite interesting. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.